All right, guys. So here we're going to talk about the capacitance and dielectrics. So a capacitance is a quantity for a device called capacitor. A capacitor is then used very widely in different applications, medical applications, electronic applications, and it's a device that can store energy. So here's sort of like, let's say, typical capacitor that you might, you know, find. So um, there are electric or electronic devices generally used in circuits and can store energy and can store charge and can act like a temporary power source. So for example, you can see that here's a, you know, flash in the camera. And a lot of times the flash in the camera is um, using a capacitor energy, especially look, there's old Kodak cameras where when you uh, take a picture, um, there is a, you know, let's say a flash. And then when the flash, you know, basically when you take a picture, there's a flash, right? And after that, in order to use the camera again with the flash, there was a little wheel that you rotate, but when you're rotating, you're doing mechanical work and that mechanical work converts your and mechanical energy into electrical energy and charges the capacitor. So then you take, can take a picture again because capacitor is a device that can store energy and store, let's say charges, but it cannot generate energy. It cannot generate, let's say, uh, like battery does. So that's why every time you use the energy inside the capacitor, you have to charge it again. Okay. So unit for the capacitance is after a Michael Faraday. So we call it Farad. And we're going to see that, let's say this, you know, it's equivalent to Coulomb per volts. So in a minute, we're going to see why it's equivalent to Coulomb per volts or Coulomb square per Newton times meters or Coulomb square per joules. We can see, right, there's already information about energy there. So Generally, what we have here is there for every quantity that we've been seeing, you know, up to this point, there are several ways you can calculate that. So that's why there are several equate, you know, several types of, you know, units for that because you can rearrange your present, you know, let's say volts in terms of other things and so on and so forth. But, uh, the capacitor generally um, come in very, very is a very small quantity. So in terms of like let's say when you're ca calculating the capacitance of the capacitor. So the capacitance usually go from 10 to the negative 12 to roughly 10 to the negative three, let's say. That's a range for the, you know, uh, let's say industrial capacitors. So this is picofarad. So then this is, let's say millifarad, but probably most commonly used is a nanofarad or a microfarad especially. So microfarad probably the most commonly used. And for example, there's an experimental lab or something like that. Um, when, when we do an experiment on campus, we're actually using uh, microfarad for the, for the capacitors. And even in our, you know, in our lab that we're gonna do, we will also have a microfarad as a, as a capacitor. All right, so here's then the capacitor as a sort of like a device represent. It's a, it's a combination of two conductors and these two conductors technically can come in any shape, but the idea here is once your capacitor, so let's say, think like this, this is your device. It's a combination of two conductors. Once it's fully charged, each conductor gonna have same amount of charges removed or taken you know, or given, but you know, opposite polarity. So one capacitor will be plus Q, the other one gonna be then minus Q. And plus Q and minus Q, basically um, always the same. That means if this is plus five nanocoulomb, this will be minus five nanocoulomb, okay? And the reason for that is simply because when you start, let's say with those capacity, you know, with those conductors, okay, let's call this conductor A, let's call this conductor B. And they are separated by some distance D, you know, some kind of, you know, finite distance D. The idea here is this, let's say you start with two neutral conductors. That means they, they, they have equal amount of positive and negative charges, okay? So that's why they're neutral. So what we do, we connect this to a battery. So here's the battery. So this is a symbol for the battery. We're gonna start drawing the circuit diagrams. So this is a symbol for the battery, or this is the positive terminal, this is the negative terminal of the battery. 
So what we do here is you take the battery and have the voltage of the battery. Remember the voltage specifically used for the, for the batteries. Whenever you're talking about potential difference between two things, two points or something. So voltage, let's say V of the battery, let's say this is five volts, for example, right? This is, let's say this is five volts. Generally five volt means that it's a potential difference between positive and negative terminals. Negative terminal generally has zero volts. Positive terminal has five volts. Hence their, you know, their potential difference is five volts. Then voltage is basically, so let's say V of the battery is potential difference between let's say these two points A and B. So this is V A B, potential difference between those two points. Now, as you can see, right, since it's a potential difference between those two points, means let's say VA minus VB, meaning that five minus zero, you get five volts, and that's the potential difference. Now, if I take a wire and I use then the wire to connect positive terminal to conductor A and negative terminal to conductor B, then what I have here is I have now a connection between them. When we start before, let's say, connection, if I would to measure the voltage of this capacitor, so let's say this configuration, right? Voltage of this capacitor, what I will get here, I will get zero. There is no voltage between, or the, you know, voltage again, no potential difference between those charge, uh, those conductors. Why? Because they're neutral. Potential difference between two neutral conductors is always zero. And the Q that we have over here, remember this, this Q that I'm, I'm talking about, that's, that represents extra charges, not how much total it has. So right now the Q is zero for both of them. So V is zero and Q is zero at T equals zero. Let's say T equals zero, this is what you get. Okay. All right, so, but as soon as we make a connection to the terminal of the battery, right away, there is an electric field. And this electric field pretty much starts from the positive terminal and go, goes and reaches, let's say, conductor A. As soon as it reaches conductor A, thing like this, there's an electric field in the conductor A now, which means that it starts affecting the charges inside. And what it does, as we know already, right, electric field mainly affects the negative charges, okay? So that means what, it, what it's gonna do is gonna take one negative charge. Let's say it's gonna take one negative charge, I'm gonna represent with this. So here's that one negative charge. So it's gonna take that and move it. Remember, since the force on a negative charge is in the opposite direction of electric field. So electric field is like this in this direction, which is clockwise. So this electron gonna move counterclockwise and go and reach the conductor B. That means this electric field gonna take one electron and move it from you know, conductor A to conductor B in an opposite direction of the electric field, which is counterclockwise. Well, once we do that, then conductor A, A has one less electron, so it becomes plus Q. Conductor B has one more electron, becomes minus Q. And then what we have here is, now that they have, you know, one minus Q and plus Q, sorry, this plus Q. Now there's a charge difference, right? Now there's this electric field, basically can go also like this, because there's now, you know, charge differences between them. Technically, the A is now become positively charged, B become negatively charged. Even if it's just a little bit, even if it's just one electron, there's already a difference in charges. So the electric field goes from A to B and then continues like this by moving more and more and more you know, charges from conductor A counterclockwise to conductor B. Eventually, as we start doing that, because now you have plus Q and minus Q, this voltage between the conductors starts increasing too, because we know, right? Voltage is proportional to electric field. Remember the equation was roughly V equals um, E times D, right? E times D sort of more or less, D being the distance between the plates. Uh, so V equals E times D um, and as the electric field, because more charges move, more different the charge, you know, let's say between the conductors. So let's say you have, you start with maybe a one nanocoulomb, two nanocoulomb, three nanocoulomb, five nanocoulomb, and every time more, more different they are, stronger the electric field, stronger the electric field, higher the voltage. So it's gonna continue like that. Now question is, that, okay, when will it stop? 
Well, it will stop when eventually the voltage of the capacitor is exactly the same as the voltage of the battery. So when it matches the voltage of the battery, then electric field stops. Electric field stops, charge is no more moving. Then we have basically this configuration. We have this configuration. Now we have two conductors fully charged and it represents plus Q minus Q. Now, hopefully you understand why plus Q minus Q are exactly the same. Because this electric field takes five nanocoulomb from one conductor, let's say conductor A, and moves it to the second conductor, conductor B. That means conductor A lost five nanocoulomb of negative charge. So that's why it's plus five nanocoulomb. Conductor B gained five nanocoulomb of negative charge. So now it's negative five nanocoulomb. That's why they're always gonna be the same. Conduct, you know, a capacitor will always have same charge, opposite polarity, right? You know, uh, between its, you know, two conductors. All right, so that's basically how the charging of a capacitor works. And then what we can say here is that once you charge, then this, you know, this charges, right? So let's say this guy has, you know, positive charges, you know, it's gonna start holding, you know, holding onto those charges. This one has negative charges, right? Even if I remove the battery now from the, you know, disconnect, like let's say completely, right? If I disconnect battery completely from a capacitor, it will still maintain those charges. And as long as it maintains those charges, there's gonna be potential difference. That means VC is equals to five volts. And let's say Q is equals to, uh, for example, again, why not? So five nanocoulomb. So that means it's basically plus minus Q, right? So you have that. So the idea here is then the capacitor is now charged and then there's an electric field between the plates, okay? Because there, you know, there's a uh, you know, charge difference, right? Because there's a voltage between the plates. That means if I remove that uh, capacitor as a device away from the, from the battery, all of those quantities will still remain, okay? Then I can go and connect it to something else let's say, a, you know, a light bulb or something like that, and have that light bulb use some of this energy that was stored inside this electric field lines. And then that's, that you know, there's this potential difference, this charges, right, can be then used to operate that, you know, light bulb for, you know, maybe like a second or a few minutes until capacitor run out, runs out of all the energy because it cannot generate its own energy. You know, you store some energy, it's used up, that's it, you have to then take it back and store, you know, charge it again. All right, so that's kind of what we have. Now, in terms of, let's say, if I have those conductors, right? As I said, like conductor A, conductor B, and this was, let's say, the battery. Again, this is the symbol for the battery, positive terminal, negative terminal. So thing like this. So if I connect it to A and connect it to B, and let's say, you know, I wait a little bit and it's fully charged. Okay, so let's say it's fully charged. Then one thing I can do here is this. So there's plus Q, there's minus Q. That means, you know, I have Q, which is the amount of charges that have been moved. Okay. So then if I have, then this is, let's say point A, then this is point B, then I can look at potential difference between those plates. So Delta V or what I just write VC, voltage of the capacitor. So Delta V, which is the potential difference between, you know, point A and B, which is basically same as voltage of the capacitor. So now if I have that quantity, which I can measure using a device we call voltmeter, so let's say if I measure the potential difference or the voltage of the capacitor and I have amount of charges that have been moved, then their ratio Q over Delta V is then what we can use to define the capacitance of the capacitor. Their ratio is then known as a capacitance of the capacitor. You can see right Q, sorry, Q is in units of Coulomb, Delta V is units of volts. So it's C over V. That's why if you go back to the very, you know, first slide, see one farad is equal to one C over V, Coulomb per volts. And you can see, right, that Coulomb per volts come exactly from here because one of the equations for the capacitance is the charges between the two conductors. And remember, capacitor as a device always has two conductors, okay? So then, then they can be separated by the, some distance D. That distance D can be finite, or technically you can take one con conductor and move it to infinity, then it becomes a self-conductance. -con but generally what you have is this, Q divided by V, this is for the you know, capacitor, right? 
and you can find the uh, uh, capacitance. This equation can be used for any configurations uh, because we're gonna see that there are different configurations. Uh, let's say there's a spherical, there is a, you know, a cylindrical, there is a you know, plane, you know, let's say symmetry. What we do here is this equation is true for any type of, you know, uh, let's say configuration. Okay, so yeah, this side unit is farad. So again, we defined Coulomb per volt to be uh, a farad. All right, so now in terms of then this equation, Q over V, so do you remember, right? So for example, voltage was, voltage of the battery was five volts. Okay, and then eventually as I mentioned, right? Voltage of the capacitor increases until it reaches, you know, five volts again, and then, you know, charging stops. In terms of then what happens here is, let's say I, if I have 15 volts instead of five volts, will then the, the value of the capacitance, let's say change? Well, let's see. It seems like, you know, the, since eventually VC is gonna be equals to VB, if you have just one capacitor, right, in your circuit, let's say if this capacitor is directly connected to the battery terminals, then if I increase VB, I will technically then increase VC. Okay, so does it mean that capacitance will change? Well, no, because one I, what I have here is, I know that V of the capacitor is, remember, right, is proportional to electric field. And if I have here more voltage, then I'm gonna have more electric field, which means then how much, you know, uh, voltage I increase, I'm gonna have more electric field, which is gonna mean it's gonna move more charges. The idea here is if I make, I think I went from five to 15, right? So if I have then three times the voltage as I had before, so let's say this V prime, right? Three times the voltage. So this is, let's say three times the VC that I had. Well, it's gonna move three times the charges. So then I'm gonna have three times Q. Well, if, I, if my voltage is 10 times as before, well, I'm gonna move 10 times more charges. As you can see, right? that makes ratio always constant, Q over V. So if you increasing voltage, that means you're just gonna increase the amount of charges moved, exactly same proportion. So this ratio Q over VC always gives you exactly same value. That means this capacitance technically is independent of how much voltage and how much charges you move. This conductor we're gonna see that is technically based on or the, the, this value of the capacitance, right? You can calculate using this ratio, but this is basically based on the geometry of the capacitor itself. You know, you can, you can calculate this by looking at different parameters, like let's say, uh, you know, the surface area, you know, the, the distance between the, you know, conductors and things like that. So we're gonna see that there's always another equation for the capacitance that is proportional or depends on the geometry of the capacitors, okay? But this equation is universal for any type of capacitor if it's connected to the, you know, let's say some kind of battery source, right? And then you can charge it, calculate how much you charge, you know, charges you have, calculate the potential difference or measure it, and then find the capacitance from here. All right, so here are some of the uh, configurations. There you go. So you can see that we can have a capacitance as a device that has a cylindrical, you know, symmetry or cylindrical, you know, geometry. So you can see, right? It's a device that depends on geometric arrangement of the conductors. Here's a cylindrical capacitor. Okay, so you have conductor A, right? And, you know, let's call it conductor A and, and you know, the blue is conductor B. So you have basically inner and outer, you know, let's say cylinders. And those are your two, uh, pretty much two conductors. Okay, so, one thing you will have here is this will be then plus Q, then this will be negative Q. And there's, you can see, right, electric field between them. Okay, once you charge. Now, see, I have one equation for the capacitance for that, you know, configuration. Uh, and it's just Q over delta V. If I have Q and I have like delta V between them, I can calculate that. But there is a second equation for this configuration, unique to this configuration, where you can find it from here. L is the length of the cylinder divided by 2Ke, that's electric constant, then ln of B, that the radius B divided by radius A. And you can see, right, the radius B, radius A are the, you know, from the center to the first conductor and to the second conductor. So this equation 
you can use specifically for the cylindrical capacitor, okay, to calculate, you know, its value. Okay. Because even if this is not charged, even if this conductor is just sitting there, right, this capacitor is just sitting there, you can calculate the capacitance from the geometry, okay? So you can see, right, it directly proportional to its length. That means I can increase capacitance by making the cylinder longer, okay? And then it depends on ln of B over A. So that means, you know, if you then do ln B over A, so then it basically also proportional to those quantities, right? Inversely proportional to ln of, you know, the radius A, radius B over radius A. And same thing with the spherical capacitor. With a spherical capacitor, again, I have two conductors. Here's conductor one, conductor A, and here's conductor B. And in a way, they're separated by some distance D, right? So distance D, where distance D is pretty much B minus A. But the idea here is that, you can see, right? This is basically the you know, distance separation distance. So the idea is that you have same Q. This is plus Q, this is minus Q, always gonna have same Q some finite distance, you know, between those two conductors. And this equation can always give you the capacitance. If I know the Q, if I know the delta V between the conductors, that ratio gives me that capacitance, okay? But also very unique to this particular, you know, geometric arrangement, then we can solve for the capacitance using the geometry, A times B, which is the radius of A times radius of B divided by K times difference of the, you know, B minus A, okay? Again, very specific to this configuration. Now, one thing we can do here is, let's say sometimes we can assume that if it's, you know, for specific, you know, let, let's say for this, you know, uh, configuration, maybe this conductor B is infinitely far away, then that's basically become sort of like, let's say, um, what we call a self, self capacitance. And you can use basically, you know, geometric arrangement to find the self capacitance of a sphere. All right. So here's that information. So capacitance of the device depends on the geometric arrangements of the conductors. The capacitance of the spherical conductor of radius R and charge Q is given with this equation, right? So then Q over KE where, um, if you remember, right? So if I'm looking at the Delta V, so if I have a sphere, radius R, voltage or the you know, uh, potential difference with respect to the infinity, right? Let's say the second conductor is infinitely far away. So then voltage or potential at, at the surface is given as KQ over R. So if I replace Delta V with that, Qs cancel out, then I have R over K which is, you know, K is one over four pi epsilon naught, and this is four pi epsilon naught times R. This is the self-capacitance. Okay, so the self-capacitance of a spherical conductor, radius R, charge Q, where we assume that the second conductor is infinitely far away. Okay. All right, so the main type of capacitance that we're gonna be using to represent, for example, um, different type of configuration we can have. By configuration, we, uh, I'm talking about, let's say, uh, having multiple capacitors in the circuit. So we're gonna be using parallel capacitance. So parallel capacitors. So the ca parallel capacitor is probably a little bit easier to work with. And all of our, you know, circuits, you know, most of the circuits, right, that I'm gonna right now do, and, you know, also the lab that we're gonna have basically is a parallel capacitor. So it is, consists of two plates that have equal area and are separated by distance D. So you can see, right? So you have two conductors, area A is exactly the same for both of them and they're separated by some distance D. Now, once I connect this to the a power source, you can see a battery, you can see, right? The left plate connected to the positive battery, positive terminal of the battery, the, the, the right plate connected to negative. So in a way, Remember, there is an electric field, right? There's a, gonna be electric field in this direction like that. And electric field then gonna move, let's say plug an, an electron from here and move it there. So then this becomes, you know, one extra positive. This is one extra negative. Then take another electron from the left plate and move it there. So 
you know, plus, this become another minus. In any case, right, eventually it's gonna, you know, charge them like this. So that's what the electric field does. Or you can also think of it like this. Since the left plate connected to the positive terminal, it's gonna have positive charges. Since the right plate connected to the negative terminal, it's gonna have a negative charges. Then V of the battery, okay? So V of the battery, remember it's always based on volt, you know, potential of the positive plate, uh, positive terminal minus potential of the negative terminal. And we always take the negative terminal to be zero volts and positive to be, I don't know, let's say some kind of six volts, for example, right? Uh, actually, I think batteries like that have 12 volts. So let's say 12 volts. That means voltage of the left plate will be 12 volts because it's connected to the exactly the 12 volt you know, terminal and voltage of the right plate will be zero volts because it's connected to the negative terminal, okay? So that's kind of what we have. And I mentioned, right? So let's say if I increase this voltage of the battery to let's say 24 volts instead of 12 volts, then I'm basically moving two times Qs and the ratio still gonna be cancel out. So Q over V, I double this, I double that, right? So then this ratio always gonna be, remain the same. So Q over V. I like to put like VC. So we know that we're specifically talking about voltage across the, the capacitor. Because if you have just a single capacitor connected to the terminal of the battery, voltage of this single capacitor always gonna ma match the voltage of the battery. But we will see that if you have more than one capacitor in, in, in your circuit, then obviously, you know, there, there, there could be different. So, which we're gonna, we're gonna look at in a, in a little bit. All right, so we can also represent, you know, the charge, you know, uh, in terms of sigma, remember sigma is a surface charge density. So you can say that the magnitude of a charge per unit area on the plate is sigma. That means, you know, you can represent it in terms of Q, also we put in terms of six, sigma. Sigma gives you a little more information. So sigma tells you that these are how the charges distribute over the, over the area. All right, so as I mentioned, every geometric arrangement has two equations. One is the general Q over V, the other one equation that specifically for that geometric arrangement. Now we have two plates with same area and some distance D between them, okay? That means, you know, sort of like, let's say we have two plates like this, they have the same area, let's say, let's assume the same area and some distance D between them. So one thing we have here is that electric field is Q over epsilon naught, sorry, sigma over epsilon naught. So this, this comes from basically uh, a Gauss's law. When we use Gauss's law for the a sheet like that. So it's sigma over epsilon naught or, you know, Q over A over epsilon naught, because again, we, we just said sigma is, you know, Q over A. And potential difference, remember, is just electric field times, you know, a distance. That means this equation, delta V is equals to Q times distance over epsilon naught times A. And then the capacitance is equals to Q over delta V. That means it's Q over then Q D over epsilon naught A. So then we cancel the Q, which means that it's independent of the Q. And this is another way of, you can see that. And we end up with epsilon, this is epsilon naught like this. Sometimes I write it like this, sometimes like that. So, so epsilon naught A over D, which means this is the equation for the capacitor with respect to its geometrical properties. Here's that equation again. So this is specific for the parallel plate. Parallel plate configuration, epsilon naught, which is a constant primitive of free space times A, the area of the plates divided by D. Remember, there's no such thing as A1, A2. We assume the area is exactly the same. D is the distance between them. So that means, you know, the area is in terms of meters square, distance is in terms of meters. Uh, and so then the capacitance will be in terms of farad. And this configuration tells you, that, or this equation tells you that for this configuration, capacitance is directly proportional to the area. That means in order for me to actually change the capacitance, I need to change the area. 
that means if I have this as our area of the plates, now if I take this and I don't know, make it bigger, then capacitance actually changes. So I make area, you know, five times bigger, capacitance becomes five times because it's directly proportional to area. All right, but it's also inversely proportional to the distance. That means if I take the second one and move it much further away, let's say 5D, right? Five times further away. So if you do this one as 5D, then this becomes one over five. That means inversely proportional. So you decrease capacitance by increasing distance, but you increase the capacitance by increasing the area. And those are the two, let's say, uh, geometric properties that capacitor depends on, the parallel plate capacitor. All right, so when we have parallel plate, and this is how we can represent parallel plate capacitor. When we charge the parallel plate capacitor, then we have electric field between the plates. And generally the electric field between the plates, you can see, right, has technically this configuration. We will verify this in a lab. And what you can see here is they're really not that uniform, let's say. But idea for the parallel plate capacitor is this. See if I look at just a small portion in the, in, the, in the central region, well, they are actually kind of uniform, okay? It's kind of uniform in that central region, not so in the, you know, around the edges. And those are, this is called basically the edge effect. So generally the capacitor is more or less uniform in the central region, not around the edges. So that's why a lot of times if we say that the length of the, the length of the capacitor. So let's say this being the length of the capacitor. If length of the capacitor is much greater than the distance between the plates, then electric field is more or less can be considered as uniform. Okay. That means imagine it's 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 really long, something like that. So here it's all going to be basically uniform from positive to negative, whatever each one is. You know, so a lot of times it makes our life much, much easier because if electric field is uniform and it's constant, then we can do some kinematic equations and so on and so forth. So it makes our life a little bit easier in terms of that. But the idea here is there is some, you know, edge effect, which we will also explore in some of the labs. All right, so now we're gonna be able to look at what we can do in terms of, let's say, to a charge a capacitor, right? And later on, start building, you know, our knowledge of the circuit symbols, right? And start doing circuit diagrams and even start putting you know capacitors in a different combination have a multiple you know capacitors in a circuit so what we have here is this so we're going to take one capacitor and this is basically one parallel plate capacitor and we connect it to the battery just like we did before the only thing we have a switch is very similar to your light switch so on and off so this is switch what we call in off you know, let's say position. And then when we move it down, that will be, it's, it's, it's basically the, the switch will be on. So um, generally we call this then a closed switch. So closed switch then is conductors. So this conductor and that conductor now in contact with one another and they are connected. So these are, these are wires. So those are wires that connect, you know, the switch to the conductor, to the, you know, to the capacitor, to the battery. As soon as we close the switch, then the charges can start moving. There could be an electric field and the capacitor can start charging. Okay. But you can see, right, before the switch is closed, the energy is stored as chemical energy in battery. Okay. So one thing that we have is that the battery has a lot of chemicals inside. And when needed, those chemicals can react and create chemical energy. As chemical energy then can be converted into electrical energy, which then can be used to, for example, charge a capacitor or operate other things. All right, so once we close the switch, then you can see right here's the electric field in the wire. And this electric field then goes around and starts moving the you know, charges from this plate to the other one, moving the next one moving the next one, right, those electrons, and eventually charge this capacitor, okay. Again, what will happen here is 
the energy is transformed from chemical to electric potential energy. And electric potential energy is what responsible for pretty much, you know, giving a capacitor its charge. So electric potential energy is related to the separation of positive and negative charges on the plates. A capacitor can be described as a device that stores energy as well as charge, okay? So the charges stored in the plates, on the plates of the capacitor, energy is stored within those electric field lines uh, between the plates. Okay. All right, so let's look at then some of the circuit diagram symbols. So here's a capacitor, which is simple enough, right? Two plates, parallel plates, parallel lines like that, representing parallel plate capacitor. I already gave you battery symbol. This is basically one long one and one short line. Long one is a positive terminal, short one is a negative terminal. And we have now a switch symbol. So open when, you know, open means that there is a open circuit. So no <clears throat> full connection, just like when your light switch is off, is similar to having a switch open. And then when you, you know, light switch is, you know, you, you, know uh, you press it and you turn on the switch, the light is working. That's because what you're doing, you, you know, you're closing the switch, which means that the charge is now moving and providing energy to your circuit. Using these diagrams, now we can start drawing, um, let's say basic circuits with one capacitor, you know, with two capacitors and things like that. So for example, you know, one thing I can do here is, so let's say if I come back here, I'm gonna do a circuit diagram for this configuration. So now we have a battery. Okay. So here's the battery, positive terminal, negative terminal. And then what I have here is there is a switch. So the switch, again, look at how the switch lo lo looks, right? So like, let's say you can start with the open and then you can do close later on. So that, and, and it doesn't matter what I put it. So I can put it here. So let's say here's my switch. It is open. And then I connect this to a, parallel plate capacitor like this. So those, those straight lines basically represent the wires. Okay, so I can put C over here, VB for the battery, and you can just put S for the switch. Once I close the switch, then there's gonna be, you know, electric field and, you know, your system will start charging. But this is the circuit diagram for that configuration. All right, so that's kind of what we can do. Now, in terms of then, um, let's say, connection that we have, if I come back over here, right? Once I close the switch, switch basically becomes just another piece of wire. It doesn't do anything. And for example, if I have then uh, two points, let's say this is point A, this is point B, which is, you know, two ends of the battery, right? See then, Point A is connected to the left plate, point B connected to the right plate of the capacitor. That means you can say that capacitor directly connected to those points A and B as well. So then voltage of the battery is basically voltage at those points A and B, which is two terminals. Then voltage of the capacitor is also equals to voltage of A and B. That's why voltage of the capacitor is equals to voltage of the battery. Okay, so that's why you can say because this plate is directly connected to point A this plate connected to point B, but point A and B are two ends of the you know, terminal of the battery, okay? So that's why if you have just one capacitor, one capacitor is directly connected to the terminal of the battery. So its voltage will always be exactly the same as the voltage of the battery. All right, so that's kind of what we have. Now, what we can see here is you can have different combination as well. Let's say you can have multiple you know, capacitors. And the reason, for example, you can put the multiple capacitors in the circuit is this. So let's say, let's say you have several parallel capacitors. Okay, so let's say you, are, you have several parallel capacitors. Let's say this is C1, this is C2, this is C3, okay. All of them, for example, is exactly, let's say exactly 10 microfarad. All of them 10 microfarad. All of them 10 microfarad. And if I want, a, let's say a circuit, 
if I want a circuit with one, you know, 10 microfarad capacitor, so I take a battery plus minus, right? And I connect to, let's say the first one, right? And I connect to the first capacitor and I have, you know, 10 microfarad, you know, capacitance in my circuit because I wanted 10 microfarad. Well, I could, I could connect to the second one or the, to the third one, but each individually connected to my battery gives me 10 microfarad capacitance. But here's the thing, I have only 10 microfarad capacitors, but let's say, what if I want 20 microfarad in my circuit? What do I do? I don't have a 20 microfarad capacitor. So does it mean I cannot have a 20 microfarad capacitor in my circuit? Or the question is, for example, what if I want five microfarad capacitor? What do I do then? Am I like stuck? Nothing I can do because, you know, there are only three, let's say, or whatever, how many amount I have, right? Only like, let's say 10 microfarad. How can I, you know, have a 20 microfarad in my circuit? Or how can I have five micro, which seems like doesn't even make sense because all of my mic, you know, capacitors are 10 microfarad. How can I have less than, you know, any of my mic, you know, capacitors? Well, here's the thing. We can actually have both. We can have 20 microfarad and we can have five microfarad by having only 10 microfarad capacitors. And that's why this combination you know, uh, let's say multi putting multiple capacitors in, in specific combination can help us to get that result. That means there are two types of configuration we're gonna get. One is known as a parallel configuration. The other one is gonna be called series. And each one individually give us one of these things. That means using one, we can actually increase have a total of increased capacitance in my circuit if I use multiple capacitors. Using the second combination, I can have less than my individual capacitors. So let's, let's do this. Then we're gonna start with the parallel configuration. And we're gonna see, let's say, how can we then achieve one of these goals? So let's say 20 or five, which one will we get if we use parallel configuration? Are we gonna increase overall capacitance or decreased overall capacitance. Okay, so each configuration requires specific type of connection. For the parallel configuration, we take, let's say, here's the first capacitor, C1. We put sort of like on top of the second capacitor, let's say C2. And what we do here is this. We, may, we connect their left you know, plates together and then we connect their right plates together. That means all of this left side now is electrically connected, okay? All of that left side is now electrically connected. That means those two plates are electrically connected and basically becomes one giant plate. So like, let's say. Now I have then the right plates connected. That means that all of the, all those two plates are electrically connected. That means this point, is exactly the same as that point basically, because it's just pretty much the same one. Then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take a battery. Then I'm gonna take, let's say, remember this is point A, this is point B, right? For the battery, let's say, representing sort of like a positive and negative terminals. So I'm gonna move this point A and connect to here, to the left wire, and the B is connecting it here. Okay. Let's call this point as A prime, B prime. Okay, A, A prime, B prime. So A sort of like A and B are the terminals of the battery. A prime, A prime, B prime are those points where I make the connection, the battery to the configuration, okay? But think like this. So even before right connection, this is basically two capacitors in parallel. That means their left plates connected, their right plates connected. And this point A prime can be anywhere. It can be representing this point can be representing that point because it doesn't matter, right? As I said, it's just one wire connecting left plates. So anywhere make I make a connection is basically it, you know, battery connects to the left overall left plates. All right. So generally, sort of like let's say we either do it somewhere in the center or let's say over here. So let's say that this is my A prime. So when I connect A to A prime, then this A prime connected to the positive terminal of the battery. B is connect to B prime. So then it's connected. So you can think like, let's say, right? So this is now my A prime. 
this is now my B prime, where A is the battery terminal positive and B is the negative terminal of the battery. Okay. Okay, so this is then what we have. Now, what's happening here is those two capacitors now connected to the battery. I have now multiple capacitors connected to the battery. Remember, each one is 10. I'm gonna make it like not 10 micro, just 10, let's say to simplify. So let's say it's 10 and 10. Okay, so now if you have both of those two, two as 10, so then what does battery sees when it's connected to that point A prime, B prime? All right, so when it does, you basically have this. Well, there's gonna be an electric field. An electric field, gonna move like this, right? So electric field comes in and gets to this A prime. Well, now when it gets to A prime, it has two paths, two different paths. So that's why a lot of times this point A prime or that point B prime, we call them junction points. Junction points, because now there's gonna be an electric field E1 and there's gonna be electric field E2, two different electric fields. So that's kind of what we have. But also let's look at this. This is voltage of AB, which is my voltage of the battery. Well, what is voltage of AB? Voltage of AB is the potential difference between those two points. Now, if I look at then, what is then voltage of the bath? So let me kind of do this. Let's look at, you know, what we get. So there are generally two conditions that we can use then to derive the equation for the capacitance. So condition one, let's look at what I have. Condition one tells me that I have voltage of the battery equals VAB. But then if I look at capacitor one, I can see that capacitor one is connected to the A prime to B prime, right? So capacitor one end is connected to A prime, the other end is connected to the B prime, so technically. Well, what it means then is that voltage of, let me put like V1, which is capacitor one, V1, is then equals V A prime B prime. How about capacitor two? Well, capacitor two also connected to A prime B prime. That means V A prime B prime is also equals to V two. But I can see then voltage of the battery, basically V A B, well, those A prime and point A also connected together and B prime and B also connected together. That means the same as A prime B prime. That means they're all equal to one another. That means voltage across capacitor one, which is A prime B prime, is the same as the voltage of the battery, in this case, which is AB. So condition one tells me that all the voltages are basically exactly the same. For V1 equals V2 equals V A prime B prime. And if A prime B prime directly connected to the battery terminals, then it's also equal to the voltage of the battery. And this is a very important thing. Every capacitor, you can see, right? So capacitor one, capacitor two. Every time you have a capacitor is connected to, you know, to one another in a parallel combination, they have exactly the same potential difference. So potential difference of capacitor one, potential different capacitor two, exactly the same because both on two ends connected to the same points, A and B, A prime, B prime. Okay, so that's kind of what we have. But then electric field, you can see, right? When it gets to the A prime, it splits into two because it has two paths. One goes above, one goes, let's say through capacitor one, the other one goes through capacitor two, which means condition two is this. Remember, electric field is what's responsible for moving charges. So what I have here is that this E here is what responsible for moving total charges. E1 responsible for moving Q1 E2 responsible for moving Q2, but each E1 and E2 is only fraction of total E. That means Q1, Q2, never, they're not equal to the total charge Q, but their sum is equal to the total charge Q. So Q equals Q1 plus Q2. And that's the condition for the, you know, charges for the capacitor. That means if I come back over here and I look at in terms of, let's say, Q1 and Q2, those Q1 on Q2 represents amount of charges moved from capacitor one, Q2 amount of charges moved from capacitor two, but total amount of charges moved in your system is then Q1 plus Q2. And that's what we have. So those are the two conditions.
So if I use those two conditions to derive the equation for the total or equivalent capacitance for the parallel combination, then I will use equation two. But for equation two, I will replace Q with the general equation for the capacitance, where capacitance is equals to Q over V, where Q can be written as product of C times V. Right? If, if I cross multiply, that's what I get. All right, so now I go back and the left side is basically the total charge. I can write it as a ratio of total capacitance times total voltage, which is basically the battery voltage or A prime B prime is equal to then Q1 is then the product of then V1 times C1 plus Q2 is the product of V2 times C2. And then from here, going back to condition one, I can see that VAB prime is same as V1 and V2. So they all can cancel out. And my final equation is this. Total capacitance in the parallel configuration is equals to sum of capacitance one and capacitance two. That means if I had 10 and another 10, I will get 20 total. That means using the hello combination, I can increase overall capacitance in my circuit. So this is then the equation for two capacitors in parallel combination, and they increase the total capacitance. All right. So again, so this is basically what I just went over. Here you can see, right, condition one, Potential difference across capacitor one is same as potential difference across capacitor two. So they have the same potential difference, which means the charges, because of the electric field has to split into two, it has two paths to go. Q1 and Q2 together, some of them is equals to Q total. Okay, so generally one thing you can see from this equation, right? Let's say since V1 is always gonna be equals to V2, the question is that which capacitor will have more charges? Well, you can look at it from this, right? Q equals C times V. So Q1 equals C times, times V1, Q2 is equals to C2 times V2. That means since V1 equals V2, the Q will be determined by the amount of capacitance. So if you have two capacitors that are connected parallel combination, because they share the same potential difference, the one that has the largest capacitance, so let's say this one is 10, this one is 100, will then have more charges moved around. So this will be, let's say, 10Q, while this one will be then 100Q. So because it's a direct proportionality, you know, it's directly equals to the capacitance. So like directly, you know, depend on the capacitance. And finally, looking at the total, we can combine those two together to, to represent just one total equivalent capacitance. That means, you know, so basically we had just those two together, C1 and C1 and C2. So now combining together, I can represent just one capacitance, which is the total capacitance, which in parallel combination ends up being the sum of your capacitors. And that's the equation equivalent capacitance for the parallel combination is C1 plus C2. And you can see, right, if you have more than, you know, two capacitors in parallel, it can be just C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus whatever, how many, com you know, capacitors you have connected in parallel. That means more, more you have in parallel, greater the capacitance value overall. Okay, and those are basically some of the things, important things, uh, specifically for the parallel. It is, you know, the capacitance is the algebraic sum of all the individual capacitances. And then it is always gonna be greater, the equivalent, right? Greater than any of the individual capacitances. So those are the two specifically parallel combination uh, characteristics. If we look at then other combination, which is called series combination. So this one, you kind of put the, the two capacitors together like next to one another rather than on top of one another. And think like this. So let's say this is point A prime. This is point A. 
let me, let me do first in terms of A. So A and B. All right. So what I can do here is this. So let's say this is then point A prime. This is point B prime, C prime, D prime. Let's say what are those points? Well, A prime, B prime represents, you know, the two points uh, across C1. C prime, D prime represent two points across C2. And one thing we can see here is this. If I'm looking at the potential difference, delta V1, right, or the voltage of one, this is equal to basically the voltage of across, you know, A prime, B prime in this particular case. However, A prime, B prime is no longer equals to the voltage of AB because capacitor one is not directly connected to the, um, to the terminal of the battery. And delta V2 is equal to then V, you know, potential difference across capacitor two is, let me put it as V2. This is gonna be then in terms of then C prime, B prime. Oh, C prime, D prime. Okay. So just like with previous one, there are two conditions that we're going to be looking at. One is in terms of what is the, you know, let's say overall uh, potential difference or the voltage for the capacitors and the charges. Again, for the charges, what we do here is this, right? So we look at the electric field. So starting from the positive terminal, then what we can do here is we can say, all right, so there's going to be electric field, right? Like this, an electric field always going to have just one path. Again, starting from positive is going to go, go through the, you know, C1 and then C2 and come back to the negative and then complete the cycle. That means the entire time, there's exactly the same electric field coming from the battery, going through C1 and going through C2. That means exactly the same amount of charges, the total charge that we have, is same as the charges move across one, same as charges move across capacitor two. That means Q total is same as Q1, same as Q2. So same amount of charge for all the capacitors connected in series, because you have all, you know, same electric field, you know, uh, moving the charges. Condition two now is in terms of then voltage. So the total is VAB, right? which is the, how much battery provides voltage to the circuit. VAB is the total voltage. But if I look at volt, you know, potential difference across the capacitor one is VA prime B prime, which is just that. That means if I take a voltmeter, remember voltmeter is a device that can measure voltage, usually given like this. So circle with the V, you know, uh, in it. So this is, means it's a voltmeter. So let's say this is a voltmeter measuring potential difference across capacitor one. That means it will measure A, a prime, B prime. Then there's a voltmeter measuring the capacitor voltage across capacitor two. It's gonna measure V C prime, D prime. And none of them equals to V A B. But the sum of A prime, B prime, and you know C prime, D prime will be equals to V A B. That means in a way total voltage I can like I can I can write it like this. So total voltage is equals to V1 plus V2 voltage across capacitor one plus voltage across capacitor two. That means, for example, if I have a 20 volt battery, this 20 volt, which is a total voltage, will be distributed to your devices. Capacitor one will be, you know. You will be given some of this voltage. Capacitor two will be given, you know, the other part of the voltage. So let's say if C1 is equals to C2, you can see, right? If I'm comparing, let's say V1 compared to V2. So looking at this general equation, C equals Q over V, I can see, right? V is then Q over C. That means V1 is equals to Q1 over C1, V2 equals Q2 over C2. Well. Since condition one tells us that if those two, one and two are in series, they have the same charge. That means Q1 and Q2 are the same. Now think like this, if C1 and C2 are also the same, if they're identical, then V1 and V2 will also be the same. None of them equal to the voltage, total voltage, but they will have the same value. That means they will actually exactly split the voltage, 10 volts and 10 volts to give you a total of 20 volts. Well, the question is that what if they're not the same? 
What if one of them is double the other one? Well, then this equation can tell you that, or, you know, maybe this one, the one that has a highest capacitance, that means using this equation, V equals Q over C, the one that has the highest capacitance will actually get the lowest voltage. Because this equation, if the, you know, smaller the C, larger the V, larger the C, smaller the V. That means if this one is 10, this one is 5, for example, that means the voltage that you get for 2 will be equal to twice the voltage of 1. Because, you know, capacitor 1 is half of capacitor, sorry, capacitor 2 is half of capacitor 1, so then it has, it will have then the double the voltage because of the inverse relationship. All right, in any ways, so if I go back and then look at then this equation 2, I can see that, all right, so total voltage is equal to the sum of voltage 1 and 2. Using, again, this equation where voltage is equal to Q over C, I can say, all right, so then modify this equation so that total voltage is total charge over total capacitance. V1 is then Q1 over C1. V2 is Q2 over C2. Okay, so basically replacing V with the Q over C ratio. But condition one tells me that Q total, Q1, Q2, they're all the same. So I can cancel, which leaves 1 over C total equals 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 as an equation to relate C1 and C2 to the total resistance. Well, what we do, is, let's say we take the inverse of both sides. The left side is then C total. So for example, then C total is equals to, remember I said that I have 210 microfarad capacitance. So if I do then 1 over 10 plus 1 over 10 to the negative 1, well, that will be 2 over 10. 2 over 10 becomes 1 5. And then 1 5 to the ne you know, negative 1 gives me 5. Which means those two together, those two 10 microfarads together, put together in series combination, end up giving me only 5 overall total capacitance, which kind of counterintuitive because you're putting two capacitors, values of 10, and end result is value of 5, half of what you put in. But that's what ends up, you know, happening with the series combination for the capacitors. So if you put two capacitors in series, then you are technically decreasing overall capacitance. So what we end up with, because of the series combination, charges for the capacitors always the same. You have 10 capacitors in series, they all have exactly the same Q. Voltage, on the other hand, is different, right? So you can say right, Q1 equals Q2 equals Q total. The voltage, as I said, right, will be then distributed. You have three capacitors, then this will be delta V3. Four capacitors, delta, delta V4. That means they, you know, each one will get small share of the total voltage, okay? So more capacitors you have, smaller the overall, you know, let's say individual voltages. Because if you have 100, and if you have to split it into two, you end up with 50 plus 50. Well, you have to have split it into four, you end up with 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25, because this cannot change. This is from the battery, okay? But then individual capacitors get less voltage if you have more and more and more capacitors in series. All right, anyways, putting it together, as I already did for you, here's the equation for the series combination for the capacitors. One over C equivalent equals one over C1 plus one over C2 which means overall you can represent equivalent capacitance with just one capacitor. That's why it's a lot of times called a simple circuit. Doesn't matter how many capacitors you have, you can put them together in a series and parallel com com combination and at the end just to present the total capacitor as just one capacitor in a circuit. Okay, so here's again for the, you know, n number of capacitors in the series. So you can see that generally again, what we do here is we take negative, you know, inverse of both sides. So left side is C equivalent and the right side then one over C1 plus one over C2, all of them at the end quantity raised to the negative one. So the inverse equivalent capacitance is the algebraic sum of the inverses of the individual capacitances. And the equivalent capacitance of series combination is always less than any individual capacitance in the combination. Hopefully you saw the pattern. 
So it was two capacitors that had 10 and 10. Equivalent is one with five. That means exactly half of it. What if this one, let's say, was 20 and 20? Well, then this will be 10. What if this one was 20 and 10? Well, in that case, you can see, right, equivalent is always less than any individual capacitor. That means it has to be less than the smallest one. That means it cannot be ever, you know, greater than 10 or even equal to 10. Probably something like eight or something like that. It will always be less than any individual ones. So you can again plug it in this calculation, in this equation, and calculate the equivalent. All right. So one of the important things about capacitors is that it can store energy. And we can calculate that energy as in terms of like let's say the work needed, you know, to move the charge from one plate to another. Okay. So remember, in terms of here's a capacitor charges don't move from one plate to another plate of the of the capacitor okay so generally we are basically talking about in terms of moving let's say from one plate to another plate like this right or you know if you have a single if they if they move right they move like this rather than moving from jumping remember this is technically this is vacuum there are no wires nothing connecting those two plates so if anything, they're moving like this, through those wires, you know, in the opposite direction of the electric field. So then the work done is using the equation that we have seen before, right? Which is, you know, work done equals, you know, we used Q naught times delta V. Well, if you're looking at the, let's say DW, then this becomes DV, okay? So, um, or actually, actually delta V DQ. So, and then, Delta V is Q over C because of the, you know, capacitor equation, right? C equals, you know, uh, Q over V. And, you know, this, this is basically potential difference or voltage, which we can replace it with Q over C. In any case, we're going to end up integrating both sides, right? If you integrate both sides, the left side is work done. The right side is an, you know, integral of Q over C dQ. 1 over C is a constant comes out, and you're just integrating Q dQ which gives you Q squared over two, and then replace this sample Q with a total charge Q. And that's the equation for the, the work done, amount of energy stored. So most of the time that energy stored is a potential energy. So we can say that the potential energy stored, you know, in the capacitor is given with Q squared over two C. So this is what we just derived using the integral. Well, but then remembering that Q is equal to C times V, right? Using that ratio. So that means if I come back and replace, you know, Q with C times V, so this will be then CV square over two C, which, you know, end up being C V square over two. And that's this version, which means I just replaced Q with C over V. So I made it Q independent. First equation is V independent. Same manipulation gives me then one half Q times V which is then C independent. That means you have three equations of basically exactly the same thing. Each one is individual, uh, individually, like let's say independent from at least one of the variables. There is no, there is no V in the first equation, there is no uh, C in the second equation, and there's no Q in the third equation, but they all give you the exactly same thing. Okay. So you can see, right, this applies to a capacitor of any geometry. The energy stored increases as the charge increases and as the potential difference increases. Okay, so in practice, there's a maximum voltage before discharge occurs between the plates. Remember, we talked about, right, maximum voltage is basically, you know, when the voltage matches the battery voltage. So the, the, the idea is that, you know, at some point, this charging process does stop, and you have then certain amount of maximum uh, voltage, maximum amount of charges, and maximum amount of energy stored. Okay, so sometimes it's useful to talk about energy um, in terms of um, energy density. Okay, so remember, I was already mentioned that when you store energy in a capacitor, they generally stored in the electric field between the plates of the capacitor. Okay, so one half, so this equation, right? One half CV square which is the second, you know, the third equation over here, one half CV square. 
see if I if, if I'm talking about specifically parallel plate capacitor, C has this equation, right? Epsilon not A over D. And V has this equation, E times D. So if I replace C and V with those equations, I can see then I end up with equation that only represented in terms of geometry of the capacitor and the electric field. So one half epsilon not A D times E square. This A times D area times distance is actually nothing but the volume. So a lot of times, we, if we divide both sides by that, let's say, you know, if you divide by V, which is basically AD, then I have this quantity, which is energy per unit volume. So potential energy per unit volume. And this is what we call energy density. So you can see, right? If U is equals to one half epsilon naught volume times E square, if I divide both sides by volume, so I'm looking at this energy per unit volume, so which is, you know, lowercase u, so it becomes one half epsilon naught E square. And that's what we have. So this is the energy density. You can see, right, energy density in any electric field is the proportional to the square of the magnitude of the electric field given at the point. That means stronger the electric field, more energy you can store. Well, electric field comes directly from uh, let's say in terms of its strength, right? Come directly from, um, let's say, you know, the voltage, right? Applied voltage. That means, you know, more voltage you apply, technically, you know, more energy you can you can store. It also, you know, uh, you can see, right? Energy density over here depends on some of the parameters. So area of the capacitor, distance between the capacitors and things like that. So how much potential energy will be stored? All right, so I think we are ready to go and solve some, you know, problems in capacitors. So you have a three microfarad capacitor and a six microfarad capacitor uh, are discharged and then connected in series. And then the series combination is then connected in parallel with an eight microfarad capacitor. Let's see if we can, you know, do the diagram of this combination. All right, so again, we are given with, you know, we're given with two capacitors three and six, and we connect them in series. That means I take one capacitor, here's then the second capacitor, and I connect in series by connecting one of their ends like this. So this is basically C1, C2. And then let's say this, let's call this, I don't know, let's call this point AB. Let's call this, you know, AB, which is the two ends of this series combination. So we connect this in parallel with the eight microfarad capacitor. That means we take another capacitor, let's call this C3, and let's call this eight microfarad. Well, C1 is three microfarad. This C2 is six microfarad. So we connect them in parallel. That means the if, if I have this as like, let's say, C and D for the eight microfarad capacitor, Thing like this. Now we connect A and C together and B and D together. That's how we connect them in parallel. And let's say somewhere over here, we can connect to the rest of the circuit. This is the you know combination diagram for this combination. Because A and C now are electrically connected. So if I call this, you know, I don't know, like A prime, some kind of junction point, well, this point has the same, let's say, voltage as A and C because they all connected electrically to one another. Same thing with this if I do like B prime. So all of the right side, right? So like these ones are all connected together. Next, next is asking what is the equivalent capacitance of this combination? That means, you know, we learn about series, we, don't, we learn about parallel, but this is actually series and parallel kind of like combined together. But still, it's nothing difficult here because what you do, you take, let's say, step-by-step -step approach. First, we can see that I cannot add C3 directly to C1 and C2, because C1 and C2, you have two series combination. First, we need to find their equivalent. So that means going from here, step one will be to find equivalent at the top path. So let's say here you have C1 and C2. That means we can combine them into single equivalent resistance, C equivalent, and we want to find, let's say, what is the value for that? Well, I know that from equation C equivalent 
is equals to one over C1 plus one over C2 to the negative one. So if I calculate that, one over three microfarad plus one over six microfarad to the negative one, then C, equal, C equivalent, if I calculate this, right, I should get uh, basically two microfarad. I'm sure you know you can handle calculation like that inside. So I get two microfarad. Okay. Again, you can see right. It always decreases. You have three and six equivalent is only two, less than even the smallest one. That means I can say that from here I can rewrite my drawing where this is junction point A prime, and then I have two capacitors now in parallel and then junction point B prime. So now this is two microfarad and this is now eight microfarad. So this is C equivalent and then this is C3. Those two now are connected in parallel. And one, one thing I know that I can combine them into a single C total, right? Between points A prime and B prime and C total in this case for those two connected in parallel is nothing but Algebraic sum is C3 plus C equivalent. So it's, you know, 2 plus 8 microfarad, so 10 microfarad. That means this is then 10 microfarad. That means as far as all those three together in that particular combination, you end up with a total of 10 microfarad capacitance. All right, should be, you should be able to then see, right, what we did. We started with the top. We combine them into sickle equivalent, and then we combine that with the uh, uh, eight microfarad. So that's why right, it's a step-by-step -step approach. Do that, do the second one, and then combine everything together. Here's another one. This time we have two parallel connected to a one in series. So for a circuit shown, find equivalent capacitance between the terminals. The energy stored on the positively charged plate of each capacitor the voltage across each capacitor, and then the total energy stored, total stored energy. All right, so a lot of things asking in this example. So what we have is this, we can see, right? We assume that this one kind of goes to some kind of battery. Okay. So let's say this is some VB. Maybe, maybe not, but let's say we only care about this particular, you know, portion of our circuit. So you have a 0.3 microfarad, and then I can say that this point here is A, this point here is B, those are junction points. Again, these are junction points because think like if there's an electric field, if there's an electric field moving like this, gets to point A, there are two paths. It can go like that, or it can go like this. So that's why those points A and B are junction points. And you always have a junction point when you have parallel you know, uh, capacitors together. So one and 0.25 are in parallel, and that combination is in series with 0.3. That means, again, that step-by-step -step approach will be this. First, we look at this part of the circuit. So I, I have, you know, so this is point three. So let's call this C1. And then I have, uh, you know, a C2. And let's say C3. Okay, so this is junction point A, this is junction point B. Those C1 and C2, sorry, C2 and C3, uh, they're connected in parallel. That means I can combine them, let's say C parallel, and with like this, CP, C parallel, equals C2 plus C3. That means C parallel is 1 plus point, one, point 0.25, so 1.25 microfarad. That means I can redraw this by just representing equivalent CP capacitance. That means now what I have here is I replace those two with the equivalent capacitance. Now let's see how that one is connected to the C1. Well, if I, again, using electric field, I can see if electric field comes in, gets to point A, then it can go through the CP and comes back. That means just one path. That means as far as the C1 and CP are concerned, right? It's just one path for the electric field. That means C1 and CP are in series together, which means then I can say, all right, I can combine those two together as well. Okay, I can combine those two together as well. And that will be just one equivalent total capacitance. Total capacitance for, do, for two in series will be one over C1 
plus one over CP to the negative one. So it will be one over 0.3 plus one over 1.25 to the negative one. All right, so if I can put this and calculate, I should be able to get 0 0.242 microfarad. Okay, that means C total is 0 0.242 microfarad. That means this is my total capacitance in the circuit. Okay, all right. This means this, you know, in terms of what I have. For part, that's part A. Part B says, okay, so what is the charge stored on positively plate, charge plate of each capacitor? Well, it's just a fancy way of saying, find, you know, Q1, Q2, and Q3. So let's say, remember, let's say if this is C1, this is C, sorry, this was C1, this was C2, and this was C3. What is Q1, Q2, and Q3? All right, so what are those values? All right, so let's let's find those. Again, so what we had is this, right? So this was C1, junction point A, C2, C3, junction point B, and goes like this, okay? So what I did here is, you know, sort of like, let's say I had three sample diagrams. So this is, this is my, you know, overall diagram. Then I combined C2 and C3 into this, which was CP. And then at the end, I combined it all together into C total. Now, one thing I can do here is this. So let's say, for example, if I go back here, remember I said it's connected to some battery. Let's say that battery is 10 volts. Let's say this 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 one here is connected to some 10 volt battery. Okay, so that means this is V battery of 10 volts. Okay. Well, you can see right if I'm looking at C1, C2, C3, so let's say I'm gonna make this as diagram one, diagram two, diagram three. So if I look at diagram one, this 10 volts is the total voltage. That you have C1, you have C2, so you have C3. That means each one gets get some parts of this total 10 volts. If I jump to diagram three, I can see that total capacitance is directly connected to the, well, you know, to the battery. That means in a way, this total capacitance gets all the voltage because it's connected to exactly the terminals of the battery. So I can say then what I have here is total capacitance equals total charge over total voltage, which is voltage of the battery, which means I can use this to find my total Q. So this is C total times V total technically, and that's 0.242 microfarad times 10 volts. So I get 2.4, so 2.42 microcoulomb. So that's my Q total. Okay, that's my Q total. All right, so let's now, let's see what we have. I have this. I have Q1, I have Q2, and I have Q3. So which one, you know, let's say Q1, Q2, or Q3, can be related to this total charge? Well, remember, the total charge is always exactly the same as any capacitor connected in series with the battery. Okay. And if I go and look at, let's say, diagram three, I can see that C total is basically, you know, has 2.4, 2.42 microcoulomb. That's what you just calculated. If I go back from that to the diagram two, I can see that C1 and CP connected in series together with the battery. That means what I can say here is this, charges across C1, Q1 is same as Q total, and then C, you know, QP is same as Q total, okay? That means at least right now what I did, I found this Q1. So Q1 is same as Q total. That means I can say that Q1 is equals to 2.42 microcoulomb. Why? Because again, 
you know, if I find Q, Q total, any capacitor connected in series with the battery also has the same Q total. But here's the thing, Q, Q2 and Q3 are not equals to Q total. What's equals to Q total is QP, which is the equivalent that remember, this, this CP over here represents parallel combination of two and three. That means in a way what I have here is this, Q total equals to QP, but QP then is equals to Q2 plus Q3. Remember the con con condition for parallel configuration? So I have that. That means I'm gonna have to need, I'm gonna need to like find a way to get, you know, Q2 plus Q2 and Q3. One thing I know for sure is Q2 plus Q3 is equals to Q total, which is equal to that value. But I don't know what Q2 is. I don't know what Q3 is, so I can't find that yet. Now let's look at something else. Now let's look at in terms of um, the voltage, because we're gonna have to come back to that. Right now we're stuck more or less to that one. Um, because part C, for example, part C of this question is asking, what is the voltage across each capacitor? So once we find that, technically we can come back to this part B. Because here's what I have. So going to the diagram three. Diagram three basically says this. C total is connected to the voltage, uh, to, the, to the battery. That means V total is equals to 10 volts. Okay. And that's basically given to the total capacitance. I go to the diagram two, I can see that this total is equals to, now that I have two in series, if you remember, right, the condition for the series in terms of the voltage is this. You have two circuit elements connected to the battery then those circuit elements in series, right? Those circuit elements share the voltage, you know, um, the battery voltage. That means this is equals to V1 plus VP. V1 plus VP. All right, so from here, for example, I can see, can I calculate V1? And then can I calculate VP? Well, equation for the voltage, if you remember, using again this ratio, V1 is gonna be equals to Q1 over C1. Well, I can do that actually because, well, I have C1. It was given to me from, from the beginning, right? It's, uh, uh, it's 0.3 microfarad. And I just calculated Q1, which is 2.42 microcoulomb. That means I can say that V1 is technically something I can calculate. So it's gonna be 2.42 42 microcoulomb divided by 0.3 microfarad. Okay. All right, so there's micros, micros gonna cancel each other. So I just have 2.42 divided by 0.3. That will just give me 8.07, right? So 8.07 volts. That means out of 10 volts, 8.07 will be taken away by this capacitor one. That means I can rearrange this. I can say then VP, that means how much voltage will be given this parallel configuration, which is those two together, is exactly gonna be V total minus V1. So it's 10 volts minus 8.07 volts. So we get roughly one point, was it 93 volts? Okay. That means potential difference between this capacitor one is gonna be 8.07. Then potential difference between those points A and B, that's gonna be 1.93. So that means V1 is 8.07, VP is 1.93. Now then how is 1.93 related to the V2 and V3? Well, those two are in parallel and they are connected both of them to this point A and B. That means V2 is equals to V3 and equals to VP equals to 1.93 volts. That means I can find then voltage of individual capacitor two and capacitor three 
if I have the potential difference between those two points A and B that they're connected to directly. All right. Now that I have this, I have V2 V and V3, I can go and calculate Q2 and Q3 because Q2 is equals to just simply C2 times V2, Q3 is equals to C3 times V3, as, as simple as that. So C2, C, well, C2 was one microfarad, so one microfarad times 1.93, and C3 was 0.25 microfarad times 1.93 volts, okay? So we can basically calculate those. Kind of like, don't have enough space, but let me kind of put it here. Okay. So, Q1 was 2.42 microcoulomb. Q2 then, we're gonna end up with, uh, so the Q2 is, you know, in terms of C2. So this should be 1.9 microcoulomb. And Q3, you technically can find from the difference of those two as well. Is then going to be 0.48 microcoulomb. Okay. So, and then you have your voltage, one voltage, two voltage, three. And then the last part is asking, what is the total stored energy? Okay. So total stored energy, that means, you know, it's, it's talking about when you have your total capacitance and, you know, let's say finding the energy in terms of one half, any of the versions of this equation that we have. So one half CV square, for example, you can use that where total capacitance is 0.242 microfarad and voltage is 10 volts squared. So we get 12.1 microjoules. So that will be the last part of this example. All right. So next we have another example here. It says an air gap parallel plate capacitor that has a plate area of two square meter and a separation of one millimeter is charged 200 volts. What is the electric field between the plates? So let's, let's do step by step. So let's say we have, uh, let's say parallel plate, right? So we're given like something like this right now. Or let me, let me do it like this. So here's the two plates and you know, so like, let's say those are the areas. So they're separated by, you know, distance D. And then this is the area A. So first one is, what is the electric field between the plates? Well, electric field, if you remember, is potential difference, is the voltage of the capacitor, right? Potential difference between the plates divided by D. Since V equals E times D equals V over D. And I'm given that they are charged by 100 volts. So 100 volts between, you know, between the capacitive plates and distance is one millimeter. Okay, so I can calculate this. So one times 10 to the negative three meters and end up with 100,000 volts per meters or 100 kilovolt per meter for the electric field. That's the strength of the electric field. Part B says, what is the electric energy density between the plates. All right, so we have the, the energy density equation where U, you know, is equals to one half epsilon naught E square. That was the energy density. So one half, 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, then 100,000 volts per meters. So we calculate, we get 44.3 millijoules per cubic meters, because you know, Energy density is energy per unit volume. All right, that's there. Part C is asking, find the total energy by multiplying your answer from part B by the volume between the plates. All right, we can do that. That means, you know, U is equals to, since U over V is equals to energy density, then U is equals to energy density times volume. Not voltage, but volume in this case. So then is 44.3, times 10 to the negative three joules per cubic meters, then times volume, and volume is just basically the area times distance, right? So volume is area times distance. So area was two meters square 
distance is one times 10 to the negative three meters. We can calculate this to be 88.5 microjoules. There you go. All right, this says determine the capacitance of this arrangement. All right, so how do we get capacitance? So we know that capacitance equals to Q over V. I have V, but I don't have Q. Well, there was another equation, right, for capacitance. If you have the, gem, the geometrical parameters, and I would do, right, epsilon naught A over D. So I can use this. I can say that this is equals to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, then times the area, two meters square, divided by distance, one times 10 to the negative three, you know, meters, and find the capacitance, which is equals to 17.7 nanofarad. And last part it says, calculate the total energy from U equals one half CV square and compare that to your answer from part C. That means we calculate potential energy from, you know, for this configuration one way, and we're gonna calculate now different way. You know, this is, this is the energy, not energy density. So one half CV square, where it's one half times 17.7 .7 times 10 to the negative nine farad times 100 volts squared. And we find this to be, well, should be no surprise, same 88.5 micro joules. There you go. All right. So next we're gonna look at capacitors that instead of having the you know air or vacuum between the plates can be filled with some kind of insulating material. And one of the things it does, it allows us to change the capacitance value without changing any of the geometric properties, without changing the area or changing the distance. That means, remember, changing the voltage and charges don't change the capacitance. The only way we can change the capacitance is by changing the, you know, geometric properties of the area, and like let's say the distance and things like that. However, let's say that's not an option. We can't change the area. We can't change the distance between them, but we can still change the capacitance, you know, mostly in this case, increase the capacitance by putting some kind of insulating material. Uh, let's say you can see rubber, plastic or wax paper, something between the plates that eventually we're gonna see end up increasing overall capacitance in the circuit. So we call this a dielectric. So the dielectric is the material between the plates that other than air or vacuum. So generally it changes the capacitance by this, you know, uh, factor kappa. Okay, this is known as dielectric constant. And dielectric, you know, the kappa value for air or vacuum is one, which is basically your, your reference. That means when kappa is one, you are dealing with air field or vacuum field capacitor. So when kappa is more than one, then you have some other insulating material. The question is that, how does that change the capacitance value? What affects really the value of the capacitance? Well, think like this. So we're gonna do an experiment. So we're gonna take the capacitors, connect it to the voltmeter and measure the potential difference. Let's say it's fully charged. So you have Q naught, C naught, right? So you can see, right? So this C naught is the charge, uh, is the capacitance row. Q naught is the charges right now. And delta V naught is the potential difference between the plates when it is filled with, you know, air or vacuum. The reading is two volts, okay? That means the reading or the voltage is two volts and it's based on Q naught and C naught. That means C naught which equals to Q naught over V naught, where in this particular case, right, voltage is basically, um, two volts from the, from the voltmeter. But here's the thing, we then take and rip, you know, put in some kind of conducting or insulating material. As soon as we do that, you can see what happens to the voltage reading. It drops from two volts to one volt, okay? And the potential difference between the plate changes by this, you know, factor. That means new delta V equals all delta V divided by some 
constant k, cup. So that is basically cup, or rather than k. That means it's decreased by this, you know, by this, you know, constant value. And this constant specific for this material. Well, that means this new delta v is less than old delta v. So that means if we then calculating the capacitance, new capacitance, then what I have is this, right? So capacitance equals Q over delta V. But interestingly enough, because we're not changing the, the plate area, the Q before and after are exactly the same. That means Q does not change at all because Q is the amount of charges placed on the area. And since we're not changing area, that's, you know, you're not changing the amount of charges. But the capacitance equals Q over delta V and becomes Q over delta V naught over kappa. And then you end up with this equation. That means the new capacitance value is equals to Q naught over delta V naught times this kappa, which means that you end up with this equation since Q naught over V naught is just nothing but the old capacitance ratio, right? So this is the old capacitance ratio. So C equals K kappa times C naught. Now in this case, when kappa is, you know, let's say, you know, when the, the, the region is filled with air, kappa is one. So then C equals to C naught. That's how you know that, you know, you're dealing with air or, you know, vacuum. But capacitance will increase by the factor of kappa when dielectric is other than, you know, air or vacuum. So any type of other material has a kappa that is greater than one. And there is no such thing as less than zero, less than one. So it's either one or greater. That means your capacitance will always you know, either be the same or increase because of the dielectric. If it's a parallel plate capacitor, then C naught is, you know, epsilon naught A over D. So you, in a way you can think like, this is more general equation when the capacitance equals kappa epsilon naught A over D. And if the, you know, if your distance or the space occupied by air, then kappa is one. So you still have epsilon naught A over D. Otherwise you can calculate the new capacitance. Again, the advantage is this, increase in capacitance, increase in maximum operating voltage. Why? Because the voltage now necessary to charge the capacitor is less, so it's more efficient. So possible mechanical support between the plates, which allows the plate to be close together without touching, thereby decreasing D and increasing C. That means those are the sort of like things that advantages using a dielectric between the plates. All right, so generally here's a sort of like an example of that. So you have two metal foils that are conductors and you put some kind of paper between them. And that can actually then increase the capacitance of the, you know, your conductors. You know, the, the two metal foils can be considered as a, a plate of a capacitor. You put some kind of paper inside then actually increases the capacitance, okay? So some, some, some of the capacitor can increase by a factor of two, three, five, 10, 20, depending on, let's say, what you're actually using. Could be even water. Water is a, you know, a large capacity, uh, the, the dielectric constant, and it can increase the capacitance. If you feel, you know, uh, the region between the plate with water actually increases by, by, by a large factor. All right, so let's look at an example here. If a parallel plate capacitor in air has a plate separation of 1.5 centimeters and a plate area of 25 centimeters square. The plates are charged to a potential difference of 250 volts and disconnected from the source. The capacitor is then immersed in distilled water. There you go. Assume the liquid is an insulator. A, determine the charge on the plates before and after the immersion. B, the capacitance and potential difference after the immersion and see the change in energy of the capacitor. All right, so let's see what we have. So for part A, we are asked to find the charge on the plates before and after immersion. Well, think like this. So we first write down what we're given. Let's say we're given separation. So we're given D is equals to 1.5 centimeters. So we, you need to convert. So 0 0.015 meters. And then also the area. 
So it's a 25 centimeter square. Well, we need, again, we need to convert. And to convert, what we do here is this. We say then 100 centimeter is one meter, and we have to square that so that becomes a centimeter square. That means it's 25 divided by 100 square. So we get 0 0.0025 meters square. We're given there is a potential difference, right? So V of the capacitor is 250 volts. Okay, so taking those values given, then let's solve for part A. What is the charge on the capacitor? All right, so we can find the charge volume um, by using this equation where C is equals to Q over V, which means then Q is equals to C times V. Well, I have V, but I'm not given C directly, but I'm given area and distance. That means I can say, sorry, I can say Q is equals to, for the C, I can use epsilon not A over D, then times V. So then 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. Area is 0 0.025 meters square divided by distance 0 0.015 meters, then times voltage of 250 volts. All right. Plug in everything to find Q, which will be 369 times 10 to the negative, negative 12 coulomb or 369 picocoulomb. That's the charges before, let's say. Well, one thing I know here is, as I mentioned, right, even if you then put it inside water, you're not changing the area of the plates. And Q technically, you know, can be changed if you have a greater area. Well, if you're not doing that, then you are not changing the Q. That means this is Q naught and this is Q. Q naught and Q are exactly the same. Before and after, exactly the same. Part B, it says find the capacitance and potential difference after immersion. All right, so then let's do this. In terms of finding um, the, capa you know, the, the capacitance after. Okay, now what I have is this. C is equals to kappa times C naught. And this is my C naught. Okay, so what I, what I have here, right, in this, you know, epsilon naught A over D, that was my C naught. Because assumed it's in air, you know, kappa was equals to one. Now C is equals to epsilon times C naught, kappa times C naught. Kappa for the water is actually 80. You can see, right, it can increase the capacitance by a factor of 80. C naught is then epsilon naught A over D, or 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. then times then 0 0.025 meters square divided by 0 0.015, 0 0.015. Right, and then I can calculate this and I can get 1.2 times 10 to the negative 10 farad. This is then the capacitance after immersion. I could technically calculate the capacitance before and compare, and I will see that this is definitely going to be a factor of 80 more than before. That means take this divide by 80, you get your old capacitance. All right, so next we want to find what is then the potential difference. Okay, so what is the potential difference after immersion? All right, so for that, again, remembering all of these values, right? So we have the Q of the 369 picocoulomb. Now new capacitance of 1.2 times 10 to the negative 10 farad. So we can calculate then voltage, you know, the new potential difference. And this will be Q over C. Okay, so it's gonna be Q over C. Or I can do that, you know, other equation where new voltage equals the old one divided by this factor of kappa. We can also you know, do that, basically same thing. So we had 250 volts for the old one, divided by 80, which is the kappa factor, right? And then we're gonna get 3.1 volts. 
you can see right before I needed 250 volts to operate when it's in water all I need is 3.1 volt to operate that's why it's more efficient you know whenever you have able to do something you know insert dielectric or something like that next is what is the charge in energy determine the you know the charge in energy of the capacitor all right so for this one let's go to the next page okay so this was part c so for the charges for the energy of the you know for the for the capacitor well we have several equations right so energy is equals to one half cv square so we have this well what I have here is in terms of then the, the calculation, right? That I can look at it. So, so I can write this as one half epsilon naught A over D for C. And then V, well, this is this is original one, right? So let's say we're talking about like energy before. So V naught. So V naught squared. Okay. So this will give me epsilon naught A V, v naught square 2D. Then the final one will be one half C, and put like C naught over there. So C final, right? Then times V final, if I want to like write like that. So it becomes one half then c final is technically remember so the difference here is then this is kappa times c naught and you know let's say v final square but v final if you remember was v initial over kappa squared so then this becomes one in terms of then So the kappa, I have kappa at the top, kappa square at the bottom. So this technically cancels with that. So then I have then epsilon naught A V final. Well, this is in terms of V initial. So V initial square to kappa D, where C naught is equal to epsilon naught A over D. We end up with that. All right. So then I look at in terms of delta u, which is u final minus u initial. That's basically, you know, when you talk about energy, it's just basically changing energy. All right, so then this is equals to, you know, just difference between those two. So that means uh, epsilon naught a v initial square over two kappa d minus epsilon naught a v initial square over two d. Because, right, it's just basically uh, just a factor of that. So I can say it's uh, epsilon naught A V naught square over 2D one, you know, cup, you know, one over kappa minus one. Okay, just by this factor. Okay. And I'm just plugging everything, all the values that we have. So in the previous slide, I have all the values. You can see like if I plug in or look at the lecture, you know, notes that I have, if I calculate this, I'm gonna get 4.45.5 uh, nanojoules. Just plug in all the values and calculate and we get 45.5 nanojoules, okay? All right, which means that energy is actually, you know, decreasing when you go and insert the dielectrics. All right. Next, we have sort of like a few applications. So this is the electric dipole in an electric, you know, the electric dipole in an electric field. So for example, what we have here is you have two charges, minus Q, plus Q, and then this P here is what we call for the electric dipole or dipole moment, okay? So the electric dipole moment P is, has a, is, a, is basically a vector always pointing from negative Q to positive Q, and it has a magnitude of two times A times Q. Well, two A is the distance between the two charges, and Q is the, you know, charge. Remember, it's a dipole. 
that means Q's are exactly the same, one is negative, one is positive, and the mind of the dipole moment is 2AQ. Okay. All right, so this has some interesting applications for this, this dipole moment. For example, let's say we have this dipole moment that is placed in a uniform electric field. And you can see, right, then this dipole moment makes an angle theta relative to the, to the field. Okay. So one thing we can do here is, well, this charge gonna have a force acting on it in the direction of electric field because it's a positive charge. This charge gonna have a force acting on it in the opposite direction of electric field because it's a negative charge. So then this is Fa sine theta is basically then the component of the force, right? Fa sine theta. Well, this is the F times A, which is the distance. That means, you know, remember this, the distance between them was 2A. So if I look at this A, so then force times distance times sine of theta. What is this quantity? Well, hopefully you can remember that this is the torque. That's the torque. And then if I look at both torques, both making them, you know, the system rotate clockwise. So I can say then the total torque, like a total torque is two times Fa sine theta. So this is then, you know, the torque in the system because of the forces acting in the dipole makes the system rotate. Okay, makes the system rotate. And what we can do here is we can say that if I kind of rearrange this, so the torque equals 2A, well, this is electric force replaced with Q times E, so it becomes 2A QE sine theta. But then I just told, to, we just talked about that 2AQ is then dipole moment, so it becomes PE sine theta. And this is basically can be used because now I have a one vector times another vector times sine of the angle between them. Well, it's nothing but a cross product. So then the torque is equals to cross product of dipole moment and electric field, All right? So dipole moment and electric field. So generally this can be used because now what you have here is there's can be also not just push or pull and things like that, but also rotation in your system. So your system can actually be rotating like this. Okay. So let's see some of the, you know, uh, equations that we can use to, let's say, relate to the other things. Well, we know that torque, just like, let's say the, the you know, if you remember work done was, was force times, force times D, right? Which is the, you know, the, the work done, force times distance. Well, when you talk about the rotation, then D, DW, which is, you know, so like an infinitesimal, like, you know, like let's say small work done equals then torque times D theta. Again, this is something we've seen in, uh, in mechanics class. So for the rotating system, the work done is torque times angular displacement, just like force times linear displacement. Okay. So then from here, what we can do is, we can say then torque, which is equals to PE sine theta. So we can then sort of like, let's say, integrate both sides, okay? So on the left side, integral of dw just gives you change in potential energy. Then on the right side, torque d theta, where you integrate from theta initial to theta final, so you replace PE sine theta. I mean, this is what the torque is. You replace that. And then <clears throat> dipole moment electric field are constant. They come out. Then then you integrate sine theta d theta between theta initial theta final. Integral of sine theta is negative cosine theta. Then apply the, the limits. And what we get, we get PE cosine theta initial minus cosine theta final, uh, which basically means that electric potential energy equals negative PE cosine theta. Okay. And what we get here is PE cosine theta is a vector times a vector times cosine the angle between them. Well, that's a dot product. It has to be dot product, right? Because on the left side is a energy. So you can have a, ve scale, a vector product because vector product gives you a result as a vector. So then the energy is just a scalar product of dipole moment times electric field, 
Okay, so that's why it's another way of see that why the you know energy is stored in those electric field lines. Okay, again, this is kind of analogous where in terms of like m m g y, so it's like a scalar quantity. Okay, so here's another interesting application: polar molecules. Okay, so you can see right molecules are polarized when separation exists between average position of negative charges and average position of positive charges. Okay, so let's take the let's take water H2O. So what you have here is you have two hydrogen, two hydrogens and one oxygen. Okay. Oxygen acts like a negative charge. Hydrogen are you know have a positive polarity. So then what you get here is you basically get electric dipole. Okay, so you guess right oxygen bonded by hydrogen atoms. So there's an angle of 150 formed between two bonds. Okay. The center of negative charge distribution near oxygen atom, and you have center of positive charge distribution at midpoint along the line joining hydrogen atom. Okay. So you get basically uh, a polar molecule. Now, so then the useful thing about this is, let's say here in the next slide. So a dipole structure of water is useful when, let's say, you're washing your hands with soap, uh, you know, soap and water. Because one thing you have here is this, right? So when your hands are dirty and greasy, you go wash your hands with just water, doesn't, you know, clean well. But when you wash with water and soap, then everything, you know, washes away. So you know, your hands then very clean afterwards. So again, so the grease and oil made up of non-polar molecules and generally not attached to water. Okay. And plain water, not very useful for removing this type of you know, crime. So what we have is that soap contains long molecules called surfactants. And what you end up with is this. So you get then a molecule, right? So let's say in this case, so in long molecules, so polarity characteristic of one and one end of molecule can be different from those at other end. That means you can have a molecule where one end is different from the other end, just like, you know, the water molecule. Right? We have, you know, two different, you know, let's say polarities and things like that. So in surf surfactant molecules, one end acts like nonpolar molecule, the other acts like a polar molecule. Now, nonpolar end, you can see, right, can attach to grease or oil molecule and the polar end attached to water molecule. So, and soap serves as chain, linking dirt and water molecules together. Then when water rinses away, grease and oil, and oil go with it, okay? That, that's why, because of the electric attractiveness of the one molecule, the way it you know, creates these dipoles, right? Can attract, you know, this oil and grease molecules attached to that, and then, you know, when you wash it away, right, it basically cleans it. All right, let's look at this example here. So the water, H2O molecule, has an electric dipole moment of 6.3 times 10 to the negative 30 coulombs times meters. A sample contains 10 to the 21 water molecules with a dipole moment all oriented in the direction of an electric field of magnitude 2.5 times 10 to the 5 Newton per coulomb. How much work is required to rotate the dipole from the disorientation, which is theta equals zero degrees, to one in which all the moments are perpendicular to the field? Theta equals 90 degrees. All right, so what we have here is this. So when all the dipoles are aligned with the electric field, the dipole electric field system has uh, the minimum potential energy because we go from theta equals zero to theta equals 90 degrees. So then you can say then work done, because this is a work done by external agent, right? External force equals change in potential energy. So we go from zero degree to 90 degree. That means energy 90 degrees minus energy at zero degrees. Okay. So going back to the equation that we had before and just including the, the n number to, you know, 
to represent that it's not just one particle, but you know, n number of particles. So it becomes negative n PE cosine of 90 degrees minus negative n PE cosine of zero degrees. And obviously we can see that this term goes to zero because cosine of 90 is zero. So then work done is equals to, so these negatives cancel out. So you then have n P cosine of zero is one. So n P E. So n is 10 to the 21. P here is 6.3 times 10 to the negative, negative 30. Coulomb times meters. And then electric field is 2.5 times 10 to the five Newton per Coulomb. So then work done is equals to 1.6 times 10 to the negative three joules. All right. So then this is basically our, you know, the work done, right? It says how much work is, you know, required to rotate the dipole. So that's the amount of work. And we can see, right, there was a positive amount of work done because then energy was increased from a negative value, uh, from a negative value, right, to a value of zero. Right, so here what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why dielectric, when inserted between the plates, changes capacitance. Now, I told you that looking at the experiment, when you connect voltmeter to the capacitor before and after, right, dielectric, we noticed that voltage decreases, but never really said why the voltage decreases. What is the reason that voltage decreases? Well, here we're going to talk about that. So let's take the capacitor and assume that here we have a capacitor that is filled with air. So air or vacuum, basically. And what we have here, like let's say this is positive terminal or positive plate, and let's say this is the negative plate. And what we get here, there's an electric field right between them from positive to negative. Okay. Now let's take a, a dielectric, which is placed outside. So like right now this is outside of my, uh, let's say capacitor. What we can see here is there are polar molecules are inside the dielectric. And they're kind of like randomly you know, oriented, right? So plus minus, left, right, thing like that. So each molecule, right, you have plus and minus. Those are the, the you know, polar molecules, okay. But you can see, right, once we placed between the plates, once we placed between the plates of a capacitor, remember, there was an electric field already. Imagine you put it here, right there. You may move this and put it right there. Well, then there's electric field. An electric field right away makes them basically oriented in different way, in the direction of electric field. So you can see, right, they all now have a very specific orientation. But at the same time, as you have that, they generate their own electric field because now they're all aligned such that positive is to the right, negative is to the left. So there's an electric field that they generate, which is then in this direction, we put like E prime. Then this E prime is in the opposite direction of the original electric field that we have before. So when you put them together, then the original electric field combined with what we call induced electric field, well then, the, and the fact is that electric field strength decreases. And since V is equal to E times D, since electric field strength decreases, voltage decreases. So that is why, you know, because of the dielectric, in a way, decreases the amount of electric field between the plates, Overall capacitance then increases because C is equal to Q over V. V decreases, automatically increases the capacitance value. Okay, so that is why the capacitance can be increased if you have a dielectric with a large dielectric constant. So you can have a factor of four, five, 10, or 80 in the case of water, right? Because the electric field between the plates, you know, decreases because of this induced, because it induces its own electric field and it, you know, modifies, right, the overall electric field between the plates. All right, so let's look at then an example like this. 
Okay, by the way, so this is the equation for the electric field, new electric field compared to what it was before. Just like voltage, it has a factor, you know, remember voltage, you know, it was original voltage divided by kappa. Now electric field is also original electric field divided by kappa. So that's why if it's a, if dielectric, for example, is 80 for water, then it's original electric field divided by 80. So it's 80 times weaker electric field when you insert this capacitor in water. Okay. And you know, I've blocked it. Here, here are some of the equations. And this is basically in terms of uh, sigma, remember, sigma is charge, uh, surface charge per density, uh, surface charge per unit area, so surface charge density. So sigma induced equals kappa minus one over kappa times original sigma. So that's why the sigma itself, right? You know, sort of like, let's say changes. And we can, you know, use this in terms of seeing how all that effect, all that effect, you know, uh, gives you end result of a larger capacitance. All right, so here's an example. You have a parallel plate capacitor has a plate separation D and a plate area A. An uncharged metallic slab of thickness A is inserted midway between the plates. Find the capacitance of the device. All right, so here's an in interesting example here. So basically, imagine, right? So you have your capacitor and then you insert this metallic slab. So what happens here is the metallic slab is basically, right? So it becomes basically right between the, you know, those capacitor, original capacitor plates. So then any charge that appears on one plate of the capacitor must induce a charge of equal magnitude and opposite sign on the near side of the slab. That means if this is positive, then at the top part of the slab, then it attracts all the negative charges, right? So then all the negatives are basically pulled toward that. So then the top becomes all negative. The bottom plate of the capacitor, or original capacitor, then attracts all the positive ones in the slab. So then positive ones are basically moving like this. And what we have here is, since it's a conductor, there is no electric field inside. So in a way you can think of like, let's become sort of like a plate here and plate there, kind okay, of like, sort of like a plate here, another plate here, and then everything else in between acts nothing but like almost like a, you know, sort of like a bridge between those top and bottom parts of the, uh, of the slab. So in a way it creates two capacitors in series. So you have two capacitors in series where then D was the original distance between the capacitive plate. Now each plate or each capacitor, so I can call it like, let's say C1, and let's call this C2. Now I have a distance of D minus, D minus A, basically, because A here is the thickness of that slab. All right, that means all I have to do here is look at in terms of find the capacitor of the device. Well, this device now becomes just the two capacitors in, um, in series. So one over C is equals to one over C1 plus one over C2. Okay, so this is equals to, well, I don't have any value of the, you know, C1 and C2 and thing like that, but I, I know that capacitance is, you know, epsilon not A over D. Or D is basically, let me, let me put it like this. Um, epsilon not A over its distance between its plates. So or let me put it like D, this was the, let's say, original equation. But the idea here is now uh, distance, right? So it's basically one over, so epsilon naught A over, and if I'm looking at the capacitor one, well, the distance here is D minus A over two, right? So D minus A over two. So it becomes D minus A over two, like this, and then plus one over then epsilon naught A over D minus, uh, sorry, D minus A over two, like this. Okay. So, which gives me then, um, so let's say epsilon naught over A, so, uh, epsilon naught times A, 
Um, and if I take the inverse of both sides, let's say take the inverse of this side as well. Okay. So what I will get here is basically this. So it's going to be epsilon naught A D minus A. This is then the total capacitance. So the total capacitance is epsilon naught A over D minus A. Okay. All right, so this is going to be the new capacitance value. Next, it says, it says, show that the capacitance of the original capacitor is unaffected by the insertion of the metallic slab if the slab is infinitesimally thin. That means basically A is pretty much, so sort of like let's say goes to zero. That means in terms of here, C is equals to the limit where A is infinitesimally small. No, I mean zero. So then um, epsilon not A over D minus A. Well, if A approaches zero, so you're just gonna get epsilon not A over D, which is basically same as what we would have had as the original value of the capacitor. That means if it's a very, very, very thin metallic slab, then it's basically not gonna affect at all the overall capacitance in the circuit. All right, so that's it for this one.